Um, so welcome everyone um, to this webinar on the developments in sedation for special care dentistry um, hosted by the Irish Society for Disability and Oral Health. Um, I was to remind, I'd, I'd like to remind people as well that um, it's really useful for you to join our membership for access to the recordings of these webinars and past webinars. Um, and also a discounted rate for our summer conference this year, which will be in Cork um, on the 6th and 7th of June, um, all about communication and special care dentistry. And the pre-conference will be on the HSE consent policy. So um, please find out more on our website. A few housekeeping rules just before we start. You can ask questions on the Q&A function and the box and the um, the toggle box at the bottom. Um, we will, um, you can ask throughout, but I will field the questions uh, to Millie during each, at, at the end of each section of her presentation. Um, and I'd highly encourage as well, just to, you know, chat um, if you have something to say, an input, not necessarily a question, um, what you do in your practice in the chat function as well. And we can kind of discuss what 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 we do um, and, and, and learn from each other. Um, you can raise your hand at the end of the webinar if you'd like to say anything um, in person as well. And there's a closed caption function um, at the bottom um as well if you if if you prefer to use that um so now on to the reason we're here today um so for those of us who practice iv sedation um it forms such a an important part of our practice um and that's clearly reflected by the great turnout that we've had this evening um the dental led iv sedation is remains consistently um a mainstay within special care and has been so for the last kind of 40 odd years um hasn't changed too much and um, so whenever there is a development um it's it's exciting for us um and it's important not to rest on what's comfortable for us but to look at kind of innovations going forward and adaptations that we can make in our practice um to ensure that our patients continue to receive the safest and most effective um, sedation for dental treatment. Um, and on that note, I'd like to introduce Miss Millie Doshi. So Millie's um, a special care uh, dentistry consultant in East Surrey Hospital and the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability in Putney. Um, aside from the, the small things she's done here and there, such as leading the National Mouth Care Matters Initiative, um, and more recently publishing a book on the oral health for older people, uh, Millie's passion lies in sedation and general anesthesia and special care dentistry. Um, and I, I, I don't, I work with Millie closely, um, and I don't often see her more excited than when we talk about new techniques for doing um for doing sedation um and i've never seen her sadder than when we finished our last vial of remy mazalam um just a few days ago um, and that's a drug she'll speak about very shortly so without further ado um i'll let you Millie, share your screen and get the presentation started thank you very much ahmed and um, it's great let me share screen and hopefully da -da -da, just hide some of these boxes let's play them start so um Ahmed can you see the uh, the presentation I can that's perfect thanks Nini. thank you um well thank you Ahmed and thank you for the society to the society for inviting me to speak today and I think Ahmed is very right I, I I really do I always have enjoyed sedation and it's one of the reasons I uh, became a special care dentist and when Ahmed and I were talking about um, what to discuss it, when we talk about developments in conscious sedation, I reflected on back in 2001 when I first graduated and I was doing sedation in primary care. So in a little community dental clinic, treating um, patients with severe special care needs alongside where manly. Um, what, what has actually changed in the last sort of 22 years? And to be honest, not very much. The techniques that I was doing back in 2020, in 2001, we're still doing today. 
Um, little things have changed, such as we have a lot more guidance, um, the concentrations of the drugs, the formulations may have changed a little, but generally we're still doing the same thing because, and we've been doing it safely and effectively for all types of patients, but especially for patients with special care needs. Um, but in the last few years, there have been sort of, there has been some more talk about using capnography, which we're going to talk about. Um, and we've done some, I've done some research with colleagues looking at EEG monitoring, which I thought would be interesting for this group. And very topically, um, as most people might well be aware, there is a new drug, which is, as, as Ahmed has said, Romimazolam, which is it, which can and has the potential to really change how we do sedation. So that's the three areas that I'm going to talk about, looking at the um, understanding of the use of capnography, discuss applications for biospectral index monitoring, and then discuss the use of romimazolam in conscious sedation. Um, I've read through the code of practice in Ireland just to make sure that everything I'm saying, if there are any differences between Ireland and England, um, uh, very few um, differences that we can talk about a bit later. So I thought it might be useful just um, to talk a little bit about my experience in sedation, because a lot of what I have done um, will, and, and a lot of the patient groups and the types of sedation um, that I carry out um, will be sort of reflected in this presentation. So for half the week, I work in Surrey. It's a hospital where we treat a wide range of patients under different types of conscious sedation. So inhalation sedation, intravenous sedation, sometimes we need to use oral or nasal sedation. And we also have good access to um, theatres, this picture of my anaesthetist Falaki there, who provides a lot of anaesthetist-led sedation for when we want a deeper level of sedation than we can provide as dentists. And we treat a wide range of patients under sedation. So people who are medically complex, a lot of people with dementia and a lot of people um, with autism and learning disabilities and it enables us to carry out their dental care in a safe and effective way. And we really know the importance of sedation, especially during the COVID pandemic when we had no access to general anaesthesia. For some of our patients, sedation, intravenous sedation was the only way in which we could carry out um, care to make sure that they were pain free and did not have severe infections. Now for the other part of the week, I work in a um, what's called the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability, which is in fact actually a residential setting. It's a, a nursing home um, who, where we provide care for about 250 patients who have very severe, profound brain injuries. And this group of patients is a very different group of patients to um, who I see in, other play, in, in my other role, and probably a group of patients that you may not see yourselves when providing sedation. Um, for some of these patients, they have very low levels of consciousness. They are called what we would we refer to them as a prolonged disorder of consciousness, where due to the impact of their brain injury, they have very low awareness states, uh, which means they may seem awake or asleep, but they're not able to respond, they're not able to speak, um, they have a very low level of consciousness. And the reason I'm mentioning this is, is really when we talk about some of the research um, using EEG monitoring a little bit later. Now these patients, 98% of our patients are in a wheelchair, so we need to sedate patients in a wheelchair Often um, due to um, sort of limb movements, um, we often need to cannulate them in their feet. About 15% of all patients have a tracheostomy tube and about 48% have are fed via a entral route. And so they are non-orally fed. So this is a very different group of patients um, for whom we provide sedation safely and effectively in a primary care setting. And it's really important when we talk about sedation that our patients are changing. We are, uh, our demographics are changing. So we have a lot more older people that we're sedating. Um, sometimes I look at my learning disability patients and I think, gosh, you've, you know, in when I first graduated, often we were uh, sedating a lot of patients who are in their twenties and thirties, but now it seems to be seeing a lot more patients who require treatment and they're in their sixties, seventies and eighties. And with an increasing older population, they will have an increasingly medically complex patient. So a lot of our patients may be ASA3. We have an increased number of people with disabilities living longer, and also an increased number of patients with dementia and other neurodegenerative diseases, but are keeping their teeth 
for longer, so they need more dental intervention. As we know, we are there are a lot more people who are obese, um, and there is an increased need for dental in intervention. For example, a lot of our um, patients, as they grow older, they may lose, you know, uh, fixed bridges that span, you know, five to five, and suddenly they don't want to have a denture, and they may want to have implants, for example. And then again, as I've spoken about, us retaining our teeth is a great thing, but often it means that in older age, we don't, you know, we have less, fewer people who have complete dentures and more people with teeth, which may need to be treated under some form of sedation. And at the other end, we have the capacity of dental services. I've spent a lot of my time working in community dental services in primary dental care, and I trained um, um, in, in, primary den in, in community dental services where we were doing sedation in community dental services. And it's really important that um, we continue to do that because this group of population, this, this population cannot always access hospitals easily. Often we need to be providing sedation closer to where they live. And um, and we're always very pro um, doing as much sedation in a safe and effective way in primary care. So when we're looking at um, sedation, it's always important that we take a risk assessment for each patient. And the way I normally do it is I first look at the patient themselves and I think, you know, oh, have they got medical comorbidities? Uh, is there anything about this patient, such as their airway, which puts them at greater risk if we're going to be giving them uh, a, a sedative? And then also looking at the treatment itself. For example, if we've got in, in Putney in the neurodisability hospital, we're treating very complex patients, but often the treatment is quite straightforward. It can be an extraction um, or filling. I'm not doing you know um, four quadrant um, dentistry in one visit. So I feel that is, is, is safer. Um, and then you have to look at the team that's providing the sedation. So here we're providing all our teams very, uh, us, are trained to treat patients with complexities, how to manage somebody with a tracheostomy, for example. And then thinking about the environment, is this patient suitable to be treated in uh, primary care? Do they need to be treated in primary care with a specialist team or should these patients be more um, safely treated in, in secondary care? And we have to think about all four things when we're risk assessing each patient. Um, for example, you may have a patient who is quite straightforward, but their treatment is very complicated. So the treat the team we may need to use may, be, may not be for more of our junior trainees, but maybe more experienced dentists. Um, and if we have patients who are high risk with complex treatment, maybe we should be thinking about seeing them in a secondary care environment. So we're just going to move on to a poll, which I'm going to let Ahmed do, just to get an idea of how many people actually have used the capnograph, EEG monitoring of some form, or Rami Mazalam. So I'll let Ahmed do that in a couple of minutes. Thanks guys, they're coming in. Just, uh, I'll give it a few more seconds and then we can uh, show you the results. It's fine, thank you. Um, there isn't an option for none, so I, I do apologize. I probably should have included that as well. Um, so I will assume that those who haven't answered are those who haven't used um, all three. Okay, so that's interesting about just over half the capnography, EEG monitoring, which is higher than I thought, and Remy Maslam. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. I'm going to turn that off. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move on to capnography. So again, when I graduated um, and for the first sort of 10, 15 years, didn't really talk about capnography. But over the last few years, we have been, you know, more people have been using it. There's been more discussion about using capnography as a uh, means to monitor patients who are having conscious sedation. Um, and for one, and one of the reasons, and, and capnography of, um, is, is measuring, looking at ventilation, 
um, of our patients. And one of the reasons there's been a lot of discussion about it is because in 2021, the second edition of this guideline came out, which is all about safe sedation practices for healthcare procedures. And this is all healthcare procedures, not just dental. Now, in the first version, they had dental representation. And in the second version, they didn't. And as part of this, they included that for all patients that are not having minimal sedation, so moderate sedation for which conscious sedation is, um, should be monitored with a catnograph. So there's a bit of a, you know, a, a concerns amount amongst dentists because half of us had never used a catnograph and suddenly thought we'd need a catnograph and an EEG monitor and also need to fast patients. Um, but luckily, I think some work that David Craig did with the chief um, office of chief, the Octo office um, was to actually um, to to uh, contact them and they um, they weren't able to change the guidance, but they were able to say that actually these guidance don't don't apply to dental practices and we should continue to um, use our intercollegiate ad advisory committee for sedation in dentistry. And I know this is mentioned as the sort of the standard in the Irish code of practice. So for that reason, um, I think there was a, a bit of relief as, uh, as, as people realised they didn't need to go out and buy a catnograph to continue to do sedation in both primary and secondary care. But actually, um, using a catnograph, and I do use one now in, in one of my places of work, can be actually useful. But it's important to think back to why. Why is it useful? Because if we look at why we're giving midazolam, we give it for all those great reasons in special care, to sedate our patients, to make them feel less anxious, to get that amnesic effect, muscle relaxation, which is great for our special care patients, especially those with movement disorders and anticonvulsants is, 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 a, is a plus. But also, we, you know, midazolam is a, causes respiratory depression. It depresses our central respiratory drive and also um, our chemoreceptor responsiveness to high levels of carbon dioxide. So um, generally when we're breathing, we're breathing because as carbon dioxide level rises, it stimulates us to breathe. But if this is dampened because we've given somebody a benzodiazepine, they're not going to breathe as much, and this will then can lead to, to issues such as respiratory depression, where people, when you give midazolam, um, generally in the first couple of minutes, you tend to get the most respiratory depression. People start to bleed, breathe slower, and their breathing becomes more shallow, and this is sort of enhanced by the muscle relaxation effect. And in some patients who may be obstructed, their airway may be structured, they're struggling, they, you may see this paradoxical breathing where they're using their diaphragms to breathe and it's sometimes called seesaw breathing and you see the chest and the stomach moving like a seesaw. In these patients, if we don't address um, respiratory depression, you may get a, long, um, a prolonged period of hypoxia, uh, which can obviously lead to respiratory address, uh, arrest. And for this reason, we always monitor our patients with a pulse oximeter. And this is what we've traditionally done, and this is what we are advised to do. But let's think back when we are looking at um, giving uh, when we're looking at giving a benzodiazepine, what can happen is our breathing slows or we have respiratory um, or we have airway obstruction, you know, often with patients putting their chins down or the tongues right arising to the roof of their mouth. And actually it's ventilation, which is what we're interested in, which is patients breathing. Oxygenation and ventilation are two different physiological processes and oxygenation, which is what we're monitoring with the pulse oximeter, is more about delivering oxygen to various tissues and various organs. And so pulse oximetry um, measures the, is an estimate of the amount of oxygen in our arterial um, blood. The red light, so the diodes pass infrared and red light through either our nail beds or fingers, toes, or, our, or within our ears, any, anywhere we've got postal tissue. And it measures and compares the level of deoxygenated hemoglobin with oxygenated hemoglobin, and it absorbs light at different wavelengths. And this is how it's, trans it's, it's then converted into a number, which is the number we see. And generally in fit and healthy people, it is 97% and above. Um, and as it, people remember that during COVID, everyone went and bought a finger um, uh, pulse oximeter, so those small ones, um, because people were worried about getting COVID and the effects of their breathing. And there were quite a lot of studies done around that time, which does show that actually um, in people with darker skin, 
Um, there can be some overestimation with that figure, and it's worth um, being aware of that. And there was a paper, I put the um, link at the bottom there, I can, change, I can share the slides, which does show that actually it's something to be aware of, the effect of skin colour on, on pulse oximeter readings. But also with pulse oximeters, there can be a lag time. So when the pulse oximeter is showing it's 95% or it's gone to 90%, that was generally at least 30 seconds ago. Um, and if you place it on your finger, it's about 30 seconds or longer. And for a lot of our special care patients who sometimes fidget a little, we may decide to put the pulse oximeter on their toe and the delay is a lot longer, 90 seconds. And pulse oximeter um, readings are impacted on by lots of things. We often need to talk about nail varnish and false nails, but also with the patients with low perfusion indexes and very cold fingers. And we know that if they're not getting blood flow, we're not we're gonna the reading we get is going to be far less accurate. And again, for a lot of our special care patients, especially those who, who are not mobile. Um, a lot of, um, can have very, very cold hands. We spend a lot, long time warming the hands up so we can get good veins. Um, and, uh, but we have to be aware that sometimes pulse oximetry um, doesn't give us the true accurate reading and there is that lag. And also lots of our patients are quite fidgety and they like to tap or they like to um, uh, sort of movement, which will mean that our, our uh, number may not be a true, true accurate representation. And that's why um, if you're thinking about these delays and, you, and I, I remember when I first graduated and when I was teaching our undergraduates, um, often people get very fixated on this number and it gives them a lot of um, you know, comfort. And sometimes I'd see patients who are um, having full chat with an undergraduate, but for some reason they're fidgeting and their uh, pulse oximeter reading is, is sort of 70, saying 76 and somebody's shouting, breathe, breathe, breathe. And we realize that actually as we get a bit more experience that the most important thing that we should be watching always is our patient. And we become very good at knowing sometimes when the pulse oximeter reading is not matching what we see, it's much more likely to be um, an issue with the pulse oximeter reading rather than our patient. But capnographs measure ventilation. They measure exhaled hair through a sample line or a cannula, and they measure the amount of carbon dioxide. And the three lines, the three different types at the top. The one on the left is got nasal specs, and it's got what we call a scoop. And the scoop sort of covers the upper lip and the upper incisors, um, and that sort of um, picks up um, sort of our mouth breathing because obviously we don't breathe just nasally. Um, they're, they're, that's the most accurate, but obviously when we're doing dentistry, the scoop sometimes gets in our way. Um, so the middle one there is a pediatric version, which has got, and it's much better. And um, it's just got a, like you can see, it's a different shape. So it just sort of covers a bit of the lip and, and that's a, another a way of, my, a, a, another sample line. And the one on the right there is just nasal specs. Um, it's not as accurate, um, but it does mean that there is nothing uh, covering the mouth. So we're not picking up the mouth breathing. Um, and all these capnographs um, have also have another tube. So you put the specs in the nose, but the you can also give patients oxygen through them as well, which can be can be useful. So um, capnography measures the um, concentration of carbon dioxide and it's, an, it's an, uh, analyzed and it's reflected in a waveform um, over time. So you can see um, where the arrow is here, you can see the waveform, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. But you also get a number, which is the capnometry number, which is generally normally between 35 and 45 is normally a good rate. Um, but what we tend to be um, interested more when we're using capnography with a pulse oximeter is, is, is the um, shape of the um, capnogram. And you can see here also, um, I'm quite lucky to have a very nice pulse oximeter, which tells me my respiratory rate tells me my perfusion index, which is really good for special care because um, perfusion indexes go from 0.2 to 20. Um, but if you're not getting a reading, it, it can tell you because it's because the perfusion rate is, is too low. Okay. Um, so this is a, a normal capnogram um, and it shows, and sometimes we describe it as in hats. So you can see um, this sort of um, hat formation um, and the bit here between A and B is it's, it's zero because this is sort of represents when you're inhale, inhaling because you have no carbon dioxide. And then between B to C and C to D is your ex expiration. And then at D, you get um, your end tidal volume. That's where we get the ETCO2 um, figure. And then um, again, between D and E, as it rapidly decreases, your, in your 
its inspiration. So that's what you really need to look at um, when you're looking at a catnobam. And as you as you look at them more uh, frequently, um, you get used to, to looking at them in conjunction with a pulse oximeter. So I'm just going to share now. I'm just going to check. Yeah, I've got the a video with you. Um, this is of my so about the buzzing. Um, this is a video I took with my dental nurse Louise with her breathing. She's got the not has got the most mouth bit, but she's breathing through her nose. Thank you, Louise. Can I ask you to now breathe really fast? So there, she's breathing normally, and then I've asked her to breathe really fast, and you can see in about two seconds it changes. And you can see the space between this sort of hat has, has decreased and you can see the pattern has changed from the left to the right. Thank you. And breathe normally again. Is it two seconds and then the hat's a flat hat. And can I now ask you to breathe slowly, make long deep breaths. The way slows down, you'll see the space between the hats, and you see the inspiration there is a lot longer, and then the hat is a lot longer. Thank you. And can I now ask you to breathe normally once again? We've seen this is about three seconds, the lag between. Um, Asking her to breathe differently and being able to pick it up in the cabinet of arms. Now, Louise, I want you to take a big, deep breath and hold your breath for as long as you can. So keep an eye on the pulse oximeter reading as well during this. Thumbs up and we'll start breathing again. You see, it's completely flat lines. Did you put it thumb up? Thank you. Okay, so um, I that when I first started using the Captain of Arthur, when we first got this machine, I must admit I used it. So I kind of thought, oh, pulse oximeter works really well. I don't need this. Um, I used it mainly for training. So when we had study days, I'd get I'd get the uh, delegates to wear it and practice that. And I think it's a really good way of showing just how quickly you can pick up. Um, uh, you know, changes in breathing, respiratory depression. You can see it's just three seconds. Um, and uh, well, the interesting thing there, I don't know if anyone picked up, was actually she stopped breathing, but her pulse oximeter reading had actually gone up from 98 to 99. Um, and actually now um, using it more with patients and using it, it does, I do find that actually I really like having that capnograph with the pulse oximeter reading and, the, and looking at the patient clinically. And it's a little bit like having a smartphone. When they first came out, somebody has said, you, you can't live without the smartphone. Um, you, you, you need it. I'd have said, no, I don't need a smartphone. But once you've had one, if somebody now took my smartphone away, I'd be like, I'd really miss it. And it would have a big impact. And I think it's a little bit like that with a capnograph. Um, now we're actually using it. And I... Um, last week, for example, I was sedating a couple of patients in my other place of work where I don't have one, and the readings were a bit off. And I sort of automatically went to look for the capnograph, thinking, "Oh, I could just just to check." Um, and it just show you that actually, that I think um, there is a real use use for it in in dentistry. And we it's one of those things we don't realise we need until we have it, as with many things in life. So the applications in dental sedation for capnographs are for medically complex patients and those patients where we really want to pick up um, their, their if they are going to have respiratory depression really early on. So those with severe respiratory disease like COPD, um, patients who have sometimes very low baseline saturations, so people who might have um, you know, saturations in their low 90s, you want to you want to pick it up quickly, often with high BMI, you want to pick up anything respiratory so that you can manage it earlier. Um, and also, again, for older people who are much more susceptible to um, sedation. But the most important thing it is an adjunct to, to clinical monitoring and clinical monitoring is is always key. 
Um, so actually, Ahmed, this is probably a good time um, to stop um, sharing us any questions about capnography because we thought we'd do the questions after each section. Yeah, thank you, really. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, really helpful information there. Guys, if you have any questions, you can field them in now, if that's OK, and then we can start asking them. Um, so um, Prof Dougal had a... Um, a kind of a question on the back of a comment. She says, I think hypnography has a significant role, but found that patients with autism or some with intellectual disability pull the nasal prongs off or it bothers them and stops them settling. So um, she, uh, they, they often tape the cannula and try to uh, the guard it so it doesn't get pulled out mid-treatment. Uh, do you have any tips for keeping in the prongs? Um, we only use um, that for those with COPD for this reason in secondary and tertiary care. And I sort, she sort of gave up with the, the groups um, that she had previously mentioned and also mentioned that it's great for sickle cell yeah that's it anything respiratory um so and i suppose in my neurodisability hospital most of the patients aren't actually physically able to pull it off so that um doesn't um impact um in other groups we have had some of our challenging behavior uh i suppose we put it on when they're quite deeply sedated um and they're moving less but there you are um professor Dougal's correct in the sense that it can be a bit more you know you can't put it on at the beginning um, I know we use it a lot with our anaesthetist led sedation and they sometimes try and put it on the beginning and the patient's like taking it off. And we're, so we have to probably wait a little bit until they are quite, um, you know, quite quite sedated before we'll actually get a, an accurate reading. That's a good point. Um, another question, what's the brand of capnograph that you showed in the video? Um, so we've got um, Massimo. Um, Massimo, it sounds like a very nice coffee machine. Actually, my colleague thought we were getting a coffee machine when I said we were getting a Massimo machine. Um, it's probably like your Rolls Royce of um, uh, uh, of pulse oximeters. I mean, it is really nice. It's got a big screen. I don't actually know how to use it properly because it's too compl it's too smart for me. Um, but it's a real um, yeah. It's a Mazima, and you can buy it in components. So you can get like the pulse oximeter bit, and then if you want to add on the capnograph bit, you buy that with it. If you want to add on EEG monitoring, you can buy that as well. Um, so it's a nice machine, but you can get lots of different. Um, um, companies make them different types and different prices I think the whole thing was about ten thousand pounds but that was with EEG monitoring so it is quite expensive at the same price as a Rolls Royce as well yes. um the last question I see coming so far is um I've just purchased one in recent weeks I work as a GDP primarily with dental anxiety what levels would you suggest I set the alarms for thanks for that um, so between um I'd say 30 and 50 because you normally get 35 to um, 35 to 45 is normal. I tend not to look at the, but you don't want the beeping. Um, you don't want it to always be beeping because that can be irritating. I tend not to look at the number that much because I work as operator sedationist. I concentrate mainly on the waveform um, and then use the pulse oximeter reading as well. Um, but I do set the alarm so they don't go off because otherwise they will um, uh, be, be irritating while you're doing your treatment thank you very much millie um i think we're good to crack on great okay uh share again and da -da -da. get back to here we are um so the next part of this talk is going to talk about bispectral index monitoring so eeg monitoring um and this is sort of what it looks around are the research that i did with some colleagues which i'm going to talk about in a moment so bispectral index monitoring measures your level of consciousness during general anesthesia and sedation and so some of you may have come across it if you're treating patients under general anesthesia and you're providing anas and your anesthetist is providing anesthesia under TIVA, which is total intravenous anesthesia, they put the monitors on their head to make sure that the patients are at the right level and are not awake. Um, and the way in which it works is you have these sort of like sticky plasters. There are four of them which are stuck across the forehead and you have your EEG, so your electroencephalogram, which I can never say, as measuring activity, which is then converted into a number so at zero, you have no activity going on in your brain. And at 100, you are awake and you're uh, responding to normal vo a voice. So hopefully it might be different at the end of this webinar. You're all about 90 and above. 
And so the planes of sedation between 60 and 90 um, would show people are in sedation. So the, the lower the number, the deeper the level of sedation. And between 40 and 60 are the numbers you'd want for general anesthesia. And so this has the potential, if you're using it with sedation, to assess the depth of sedation for, for patients who do not have verbal communication. And um, here's uh, my colleague, or if, if you come and visit Putney, you'll have a photo, is, is Stephen Woolley. He's got the, you see the four sensors stuck to his forehead and attached to a BIS monitor there with a good, um, a good number. Um, but it's also worth knowing that um, you can get um, different ways of measuring EEG. It's not just BIS monitoring. Um, and this is there's another um, uh, another scale called the patient state index, the PSI, and that's where man is very not a great picture of Graham I did for Graham on that day, but um, it shows he's got different number of stickers going up above the head, and then the cable sort of goes over the head like that, which is a a little bit um, uh, uh, can be a little bit different. And then, um, so here is a, is a biz monitor. And um, what you can see here is you have a number. So you have the 83 and the four bars at the top show your signal quality. And the more bars, the better quality. So the more accurate the number. And um, the EMG, which is your muscle activity, is there in bars as well. Um, on the yellow, you have the you have the sort of waveform of the uh, BIS readings over time. And then at the bottom, um, you have EMG, which is your muscle activity. So thinking about conscious sedation and going back to our Wiley definition that we've used for years and years, conscious sedation um, is, and the reason why BIS monitoring might be useful is this, this um, the definition always talks about having verbal contact with the patient is maintained. Um, but for a lot of our patients are nonverbal, for example, patients with severe learning disabilities. And the patient groups I mentioned at the beginning here uh, about uh, who have a neuro disability are, have a very low level of consciousness. And that again contraindicates this definition where we're talking about a margin of safety where um, to render wide enough to render loss of consciousness unlikely. So for these patients, when you start to sedate them, it can be quite dif difficult, especially for our trainees, because you're giving the sedation, they're not, the patient's not talking to you as they would be if they were able to speak, um, or they're not that consciousness. So we're not really sure, like, should I give a bit more midazolam? Will this make it safer? Will they get more close to the end point? Um, so BIS monitoring is a way in which we can um, complement what we're doing clinically and it can check. So well, actually this figure, okay, this patient's BIS monitor is 70 reading. That must mean they're in a, a good level of sedation. Um, my good friend, Anna and colleague um, did a study back in uh, 2004, um, 2014, looking at bispectral monitoring for sedation for patients with anxiety. And um, what she found, there was a good correlation between when she thought she was at the end point and the reading. Um, and, and actually one of her um, recommendations was that we would do this, that, that, to do the study again, but looking at patients who were nonverbal. And that's when we were lucky enough to get a SARD grant and, and we worked with uh, Meg and, and Helen, who are uh, dental, senior dental officers in Kent and Surrey, and we did a study to look at the feasibility of whether actually bispectral index monitoring is feasible in this group. Because as we all know, it can be very difficult even to sometimes put nasal specs or pulse oximeter on, let alone stickers on somebody's head. And our objectives really were whether these patients actually accept the sensors. Um, you know, is there much change in 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 the um, readings um, when we're giving sedation, and does patient movement interfere with the sensor reading? And is there a dis difference between those patients who we're sedating because of care resistant behaviours and those with a low level of consciousness? And so here's a picture of, of some data collection. We did um, undertook, our aim was 30 patients. So the sedation dentists and the sedation dentists were either Panel or myself. We couldn't see the reading of the monitor. So we just did our treatment as usual. And we stuck the sticker, the, we stuck the monitor on the head and somebody was taking readings. And so when we got to the end point, we put our thumbs up um, and um, they would take down the, the reading and then we do our treatments. They took readings throughout that and then we looked at them afterwards. 
And what we found, um, we had 31 patients, 10 who or 10 who had a neuro disability and 21 who had learned disability. Um, we were unable actually only to we were unable to place the sensors on two patients. One of the neurodisability patients got very um, agitated, so we had to take them off. And one patient with a learning disability, it was not possible to put it on. Um, not surprisingly, some of our patients with a neurodisability had a lower initial vis value, so 84 and 86. Um, but what we did find was that um, we got a good reading, but actually there was a lot of movement, um, especially when we were doing dental treatment, that uh, meant the signal quality was poor. And so the um, accuracy of the BIS readings during treatment wasn't as good. And that most patients returned to baseline in recovery. We did have a couple of outliers there, which um, probably was quite good that I was blinded to the results uh, um, because you can see there was one patient who is 31 to 35 and one which is lower than what we'd want in a general anesthetic and one between 50 and 60. But these were, were outliers. The patients were clinically fine. Um, and this is one of the traces um, that we use. You can see um, this is one of, I think, Panama and Helen's cases where um, the sensor was applied after the patient had been given 10 milligrams of um, iron um, midazolam. And you can see that, um, that the endpoint corresponded with when they gave local anesthetic and gradually um, the number, the, the, as they recovered the patient, um, the, the biz number rose again. Um, and the bottom there, you can see um, that um, there's lots of the, the orange line is the um, uh, muscle movement. And you can see that, um, that there were lots of artifacts, especially when with using suction or ultrasonic scaling, um, but also like the, the sectioning the tooth. So the actual practical applications of BIS monitoring, um, so actually using it, so our, our, when we are, is you know, there is a bit of a delay of reading. Often you put the four stickers on and then it says press number three, press number two, press number four, and that could take a number of minutes um, adjusting the sensors. It is difficult because if you have, the more wires you have around a patient, the more things you have to trip over and it can be quite, you know, the patient feels quite restrained um, and having this, and, and the other was, was really accuracy of the readings, um, you know, especially during treatment. And our summary recommendations really were that it was possible to apply them, um, that dental treatment causes lots of muscle activity, which impacts on the reliability. That mainly, in most cases, uh, patients went back to their normal biz range at the end of sedation. But you know, it'd be very good as a training, as an adjunct to training when we start, when people are starting off training these groups in special care dentistry. And I think there could be, you know, we only did 10 patients with a neurodisability, but if we were going to look at doing further research, this is the group where I think it would be really useful in um, with patients with very low baseline cognition, the cognitive function. But also if we were going to look at it further, another group um, is patients with dementia, um, because as we'll be as some of you will be aware, um, that when patients with dementia have general anesthetics, they can have um, a high risk of post-operative delirium. And often this is associated with having very low biz values. So it might be another group that would be quite interesting to, to measure um, when we are providing intravenous sedation to have a look at how they recover afterwards and whether their numbers do drop and do, and do come back to normal. So again, I think um, this is again, probably a time to, to stop sharing. Um, we can have some questions on that before we move on to Remy Mazalam. Yeah, um, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, really for a whistle stop tour on on um, biz monitors um we have one question so far we have um do you get a bispectral reading number as a baseline or at assessment i'm um, not at assessment um it, you can do and uh, normally it's on the day as you, as a baseline just before you start your sedation that's ideally when you want a number so then you can then see the changes um i'm not sure there'd be that much point in getting um, a, a, a baseline number reading as we would do with other um, blood pressures and pulse ox readings. Um, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll crack on if that's okay. Yeah, I suppose my, my main thing about that would be if you had some money to spend, you're probably better off getting a catnograph than an EEG monitor. And actually getting an EEG monitor is quite interesting for research and training, I think, um, rather than everyday practice. So I'll share again and we'll go on to um uh, remy maslan okay 
So Remy Mazalam, this is really exciting again for I'm sure everybody that does sedation and those for us that have been doing it for a long time. It is very exciting to have uh, the new drug. People have been talking about it for a long time, um, but it's really good to be able to to use it as well. So why why Remy Mazalam? Because actually, to be honest, midazolam is pretty good. It's safe and effective. Um, and, um, you know, we can do most most of our conscious sedation with um, midazolam. Midazolam is a short-acting benzodiazepine, but Remimazolam is an ultra-short-acting benzodiazepine. It's been around for several years, um, but it was licensed in Europe for procedural sedation back in 2021. Um, and it's been used a lot in sort of um, med other medical procedures, such as endoscopy, where they've done more studies. And it has been licensed recently for, uh, for GA as well. And the difference between midazolam and remimazolam, it has this ester side ring that allows rapid hydrolysis, which means, as we know, midazolam is metabolized by the liver and it's quite slow. One of the disadvantages sometimes is patients take a long time to recover. But with remimazolam, you get very, it's metabolized very quickly because it's not dependent on the liver. It has no active metabolites, so um, it wears off faster. It, um, and there's a lower incidence of respiratory depression, and hypertension, which again, respiratory depression is something that I think, you know, having sedated patients who, with, who are anxious and ASA1 to now sedating more complex patients, you tend to get more respiratory depression with our special care dental types of patients. So there is lots of benefits for remimazolam. They both act on um, GABA receptors, but remimazolam has a high affinity for the GABA receptor, which means that's why it works so quickly. There's fast uptake. And the um, distribution um, uh, half-life is, is quite different. So it's 30 seconds to two minutes, whereas it's a bit longer for midazolam. And the elimination is between seven, half-life is seven and a half minutes, whereas it's one and a half hours as talked about it's metabolized differently um, and they can both both drugs can they're both benzodiazepines so they can both be reversed with flumazenil and and both have amnesic properties so back in 2023 we knew people were starting to use it but we got some obviously we were waiting for advice and so the IACSD released a statement which um, this is about remimazolam and I've just highlighted I think the important bits there so it's the same clinical standards of midazolam and training for midazolam so you you know, the advice is that you do go and have some training. You don't just start using it. So it can be an operator sedationist technique. So you don't need to be a separate operator and sedationist. You do need an escort. Um, the, this, it shouldn't be, Remimazolam and Midazolam shouldn't you be used in combination on a routine basis in primary care without justification. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And it should be um, reconstituted, drawn up and clearly labeled by the clinician who is administering the drug. And also the importance is we can't use it, in, it hasn't been licensed in children yet, so it's only for use for people who are 18 years of age and over. So the advantages in special care dentistry, when you look at the pharmacological and physiological properties of the drug is, it's great because it works quickly, which is, which is good, because sometimes it can take a long time for our patients to settle. The recovery is much faster. It's good for short procedures and long procedures. We get this reduced respiratory depression. It's much great for, great for, it's good for older people, medically compromised. Those people, if you recover faster, we often have people who have difficulties with sedation aftercare, um, behind their eyes and airway issues and sleep apnea. But some of the disadvantages, so firstly, it can be that you have to reconstitute a drug. And I don't really think that's a disadvantage. It's just, it's a change from our everyday practice and it takes a little bit longer. Um, I remember the first time we reconstituted the drug here, the three of us are very experienced. It was like we were doing brain surgery, but once you get used to it, it becomes, it becomes slick. The cost is 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 a, is a disadvantage because it's this great drug, um, and I I know that uh, my pharmacy um, told me that um, unfortunately at this time midazolam has actually come down in price. So midazolam is twenty one pence a vial in a hospital or um, uh, trust setting, but remimazolam is twenty two pounds fifty. So there is a huge difference there in cost. At the moment, we have. You know, compared to midazolam, we've got years and years and years of data. We have very, very limited data in dentistry and no data in special care dentistry that I'm aware of yet. Um, some people worry about being an operator sedationist, but as talk about later, once you've used it a lot, it is possible to be both. 
Um, and it is a different type of sedation, which we'll discuss then, then midazolam. So um, I'm just gonna put, I'm gonna actually, this video of, um, it's actually Ahmed, who's uh, he's drawing up or constituting the um, Rem Remy Mazalam. So talk a little bit about it. So it comes in these glass vials and it almost looks like a white tablet. And it has this flip off cap that um, you can see there. And because we want the aseptic non-touch technique, we, we wipe over the top and we then dilute it um, with saline only. It's important that we don't, um, we don't shake it, we just swirl it to allow the tablet to dissolve and become very clear. And once it's reconstituted, it should be used within 20 hours, but ideally we should be using it relatively um, soon after reconstituting it. Okay. And what one of the things in it is it does contain dextran. And so, you know, one of the, um, uh, it, we're always told not to give it for people with a dextran allergy. Um, and I'll ask it to all of you, if anybody, please do let us know on this webinar whether you have come across somebody with a dextran allergy. And there have been a couple of reports, I think, um, in Japan where it was used about people in a theatre setting possibly having a reaction to dextran in Roman Mazalam. At the time, I'm not always sure whether it was that or another agent. Um, but from the data that we haven't heard of anything happening in the in the United Kingdom yet. And I think the drug is being used quite a lot in primary care because of the fast recovery. So, um, you know, even though there is an increased cost, you can see patients, you see more patients in a day and it's being used more in um, hospital settings. So the Shane that Armour there is very carefully reconstituting it. So he's drawn up the saline, he's um, put it into the Roman Mazalam, dissolved the, the tablet and is now drawing it up. But I will move on actually to um, the next slide. So the instructions from, um, it's the drug, the trade name is by favor, um, is that um, you should draw it up with eight mils, 8.2 mils of liquid. And so you have 20 milligrams in eight mils. And a lot of us that are using it um, find that too complicated. We want, if we're introducing a new drug, we want it to be safe and we want it to be easy. And, um, you know, 20, so we actually uh, um, dilute it with 20 mils so that you have one milligram per one mil. And then the maths is much easier to use rather than 2.5 milligrams per mil. Um, and it's just much easier. And I think this cuts down any risk. And, you know, when you're concentrating your juice, it's stressful treating sometimes special care patients or, or treating patients on the sedation. Um, you want it to be as easy as, as possible. Um, so that's why we, we do that. And I know uh, a lot of my colleagues do that as well. The dosing suggestions, and I think this has been based on maybe endoscopy procedures that come with the um, bifavo. Um, they have different dosing su um, suggestions if you're going to use an opioid or not. We're using it str uh, just just the um, uh, Romy Mazalam. And for those people who are over 60 or um, under 65 or over 50 kilograms, they advise seven milligrams, wait a couple of minutes and then give 2.5 milligrams. And again, like with Midazolam, we have a reduced titration regime for older people. We have the same with Remy Mazalam. But actually, when we started doing seven milligrams, we found that they were actually too sedated too quickly. So what we do is we've just slowed it down a little bit. So we give um, generally um, five milligrams over one minute and wait two minutes. And then rather than the 2.5 maintenance, we give two milligrams just because it's much easier to titrate two milligrams than 2.5. And this seems to be working really well. And um, for a lot of our special care patients, those with comorbidities, we go down to the three milligrams um, and then um, give the two milligrams. And I think different people are doing slightly different regimes. I know some people are giving it um, like as a very slow infusion. Um, and the more we use the drug, the more we get used to it. Um, so I checked out um, what happens in Ireland. It's quite similar. Um, you have a similar sort of drugs and therapeutics committee. Um, a lot of this is based on applicant. Um, you have to apply and go to a meeting, look at the evidence. And also something, if you're trying to introduce a drug which is so much more expensive, look at the costings and why the benefits to the patient and whether there is any cost effectiveness by seeing more patients. And then once you've got the drug approved, there is obviously the training and the governance that goes around it and working. And normally the training, team training within your center is, is I think is always the best way in which to do the training or work with somebody that has been using the drug. 
The practicalities are identical to midazolam. So your pre-checks there, you know, having flumazenil during sedation and after sedation. So there's nothing that's different there at all. Um, and so obviously because it's a new drug, um, we've been evaluating as we've we've gone along. Um, so, and everything I taught, I would not say that I'm an expert in Remimazolam, um, but these are the number of cases I've been involved in. Um, and so um, get, uh, getting it, the more we use it, the more we learn. Um, so in Surrey, um, we generally our patients between 31 and 70 um, ages are between 31 and 77. I think in Putney, they tend to be between 50 and 60. You can see the ASA there, partly they're all they are all ASA3, um, back in, in Surrey, a mixture. Um, also, we when we started it at Surrey, we worked with our all surgeons because they're really good patients because they have no ASA1, ASA2, um, surgical extractions, good way to start. The mean dose, um, I think there've only two patients I've had to get open two vials, but the mean dose is generally the 13 or 15 milligrams. Um, the end point, um, so with midazolam, you will give your say two milligrams, wait two minutes and then another milligram. It might be, you know, it could be about five minutes, six minutes before they're ready for local. Uh, but here you give them that first dose and the end point is very quick. So they're sedated very quickly. Um, Ellis grading, um, which we use, which refers to Ellis 1, which is excellent sedation, 2, a little bit tricky, 3, quite tricky, and 4, very difficult exam, only 5, abandon. Um, you can see that most of our patients are treated, um, uh, you know, the, the sedation operating conditions are very, very good. And recovery time, so is after, and when I'm after the last increment of the uh, Romimazolam is 12, 13 minutes. Haven't had to give flumazenil touch wood yet. Um, and complications, not really complications, had to give sometimes some supplemental oxygen for a couple of cases, um, but nothing too um, severe. And um, so the flexions um, are, and I'm going to talk about different groups in a moment, is one of the things is the very quick onset you get used to. So sometimes with midazolam, you're giving it slowly and then you get the local be getting ready and then you'll be ready to give it. Here it's like, bam, you give the drug and within a minute, um, the patient is really sedated. And often I give the drug and give the local a minute later. You sometimes have to warn your teams. I had to warn some of my nurses and, and sometimes they do that. They get they sedate so quickly that sometimes the eyes roll to the back of their head and it can be quite a lot because it's different to midazolam. You don't see that. And that's sometimes uh, cause a couple of people a bit of stress, uh, a bit of stress, fast recovery. And that's, that's the amazing thing. The patients just get up and it's almost like they get up from not uh, having local anesthetic. They haven't got that sort of um they're not sometimes they are not everyone but they're not very um they're good on their feet they're not um not swaying um and sometimes they may seem a bit less sedated so they when i first started giving it i was a bit wide oh, are they sedated enough um it's a bit similar to propofol they haven't they are very anxiolytic so they're really relaxed but they're not that deeply sedated which is a good thing in a way um, less respiratory depression, talk about that, um, and feedback has been good. The practicalities, the drawing up is, um, you, get, you get used to it. Um, but often sometimes I find it a bit challenging is if you have got to the end of that last, um, maybe because the cost is so much, that last file, or can we get away with, with, do we need to get another one? And if you have to drop another one, that could take up to about a minute or two minutes. So just going to go through this different sort of special care groups and, and some of the advantages looking at a few cases. I'll just keep a check on time, which is quite tight. Um, so for anxiety, um, much lighter sedation. Um, but what's great is that you can um, top up the drug. So say if you've um, you've got uh, if you're sedating the patient, recovering in there, recovering them in your chair. Um, sometimes what you find is that if you've done the extraction, well, you don't want to then give another big bolus of midazolam or titrate midazolam you know, 30 minutes after you started because then that patient's going to be in that chair for a long time. But with um, Romy Mazalam, you can top it up really, you can top it up so almost the patient becomes quite alert again and then you can give some and um, it means that they um, become a lot more sedate and you can maybe do more treatment than you initially planned depending on how things are going. Really good amnesia with our oral surgery patients um, we found that because they wake up so quickly and um, they're often like oh when are you going to start um, and you're like no we've done it um, and, 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 that, and they don't remember anything. I've been sedating at Surrey for 10 years and some of their patients I've sedated 
quite a lot. So I know how they say it with Ndazalam. And there's one lady who's medically complex and she actually even rang to say it was great. I went home, I was able to give my elderly mother directions in the car. I feel totally fine. So patients like it because they don't get that post-op drowsiness. With our medically compromised, um, especially in our brain injury group, we're getting very minimal respiratory depression, especially when we're, uh, we're treating patients who have low SATs, which I often do have, especially those who have respiratory compromise and a bit worried about, you know, really careful with Azalam, finally with Romimazalam, still careful, but they are... Um, that the, the respiratory depression isn't isn't there, which is great. So if sedated people with SATs of baseline 92, 91, and it sort of stays at a level, even increased in some people. Older adults, um, there are increased risk factors. Um, sedation is so much more potent with older people and there's risk of over sedation. And this is where I think Remazlam is great because that would, you know, the recovery is better when they get up. I'm not worried that they're gonna fall over. Um, with people with dementia, they get come back to their baseline, they know where they are really quickly. And that's great as well, especially when you're doing short, you know, for patients you need to take, do a short procedure, an older adult, and they will often sleep for a long time or become more sedate with respiratory depression after you finish with older adults, Romimazolam is great. Care-resistant care behaviors, it's good, but when do you draw it's sometimes with Roman Maslam, we tend to draw it up after we've cannulated, or when we know that we can cannulate somebody easily. Um, and with, with midazolam, when you're treating somebody with severe learning disabilities, you want to cannulate, give the drug as quickly as possible. But sometimes there's a cost of the drug. We don't want to draw it up just in case for that reason we can't cannulate them or we have to give them oral nasal. Um, the sedation is quite similar to midazolam. So for those patients who are very fidgety and difficult under midazolam, they tend to be the same under remazolam we're finding. But the quick recovery is beneficial because of those patients who try and get up and they're trying to get and they're stumbling all over the place. Um, Romimazolam, they get up and they're able to go and you don't have that worry, so you don't really need to reverse them as, as much. Movement disorders, we treat people with cerebral palsy, tremors, Huntington's and Parkinson's disease, and Parkinson's disease, and the mu uh, muscle activity is a bit like a switch. They just become relaxed, they stop moving. Um, you have to keep topping it up because otherwise they start moving and they become back to baseline very quickly. And I think that's great because sometimes, you know, especially people with movement disorders, again, you're worried about them moving after they've been sedated, but um, that's been, you know, a big eye opener. So as we come to the end of uh, the webinar, should Medazlam um, be replaced by Remazlam? I'd probably say not yet. Um, I think cost is a big thing. It's a great drug. And I think in special care dentistry with the types of patients we treat, um, there are some indications and there's some patients that I would hate now to treat with Medazlam. I'd much prefer Remazlam. But whether the cost of the drug outweighs all these advantages, say for your ASA 1, 2s, doing routine dentistry, may not yet unless you're doing it privately where, you know, you can see more patients. Um, it's definitely a really, really good drug. Um, the more we've used it, I find that I can use it um, and as is Ahmed, as an operator sedationist, you don't need a separate, a separator op you don't need a separate operator and sedationist. So I think it's gonna have huge potentials. So just to summarize, sedation is safe and effective. Capnography does have a place and it's always useful to, to have a go with the capnograph to, it's great for training and for some groups. There's interest in bispectral index monitoring, and I'm sure there'll be more research carried out. And I think Roman Maslam can potentially change who we sedate, especially in primary care, because we can safely sedate patients. But obviously more research is needed. We need to be collecting all this data and pooling it and sharing it. And if we can use it in our older population, of which we'll have a lot more people, hopefully they'll all be going out of the sedation room dancing like that, rather than sort of you praying that they don't slip over on something on their way home. So I'm sorry I rushed it at the end, but I didn't realise I was enjoying talking about Remy Mazalam so much that I um, got carried away. And um, yes, as, as, as Ahmed knows, I talked too much, but I can take questions unless people have to go. Vinny, thank you so much. That was an incredible whistle stop tour of all the um, the innovations that you're putting into practice and that are available um, to modify our um, techniques and add to our armamentarium for um, sedation for special care patients. Um, there, um, I'd encourage everyone to kind of share their experiences. Um, I'm sure many would be curious, as would I, about how they have found working with Remy Mazalam. Um, and if you have any, uh, so please comment in the chat box. If you have any questions as well on it, um, please do let us know. Um, so I have a 
comment here. And um, the cost effectiveness studies in general medicine suggest that there is a uh, cost saving to be had um, that far outweighs the drug cost because of the increased throughput on short procedures and reduced recovery time, etc. Have you done or are there any health economic studies in dentistry? Um, we have just ordered for the first time in our uh, hospital, asked no questions. Um, lucky you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> very different to, to, to your experience really um but um argument would be that it's far cheaper than lots of our dental materials or half an hour of our team's time yeah um i so i don't there are probably there are cost effectiveness studies and i think there's something in glasgow where they were trying to use it for endoscopy and they actually said no the cost doesn't the benefit doesn't that way. I think what the issue is for us if we're using it in special care dentistry is our patients take a bit more time. I think cost effectiveness could be done very quickly on ASA one, two, or surgery patients, but our patients, and I think it it will be more cost effective. But I think first of all, before we do that, we need to do a bit more, just making sure we're 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 using it in this group because I I don't know of any. Um, I speak to colleagues who are using it in special care dentistry. I don't know of anyone actually using it. It's, been, it's not been used that much. And we have to first show that it's good. And then cost effectiveness studies will need to be done. And that's what I keep saying to the Drugs and Therapeutic Committee, as I seem to be a frequent member at their meeting, like a standing agenda item now. Um, but as we all know that um, lots of trusts are in deficit, well, in England, lots of trusts are in deficit. They're huge issues. And, you know, it's... I used to think my dad's was two pounds and then it was, it was disheartening to find out it was 21 pence. It just went down at the wrong time, I think. It's a bit like flumazenol. The reason we never used to use flumazenol initially was because it was um, still under, um, it used to be very expensive when it was um, a Nexate only. Um, and that's the reason that um, people used to not like using flumazenol a lot. Um, thank you, Millie. Um, another uh, kind of comment as well, but maybe we can help. Um, in the north of Ireland, it's not on the HSC formulary, um, so not as available as of yet. Um, I don't imagine it will be unless people start advocating for the use of it. And 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 are there any tips on how we might start doing that? Um, I think I mean obviously you have to apply for it to be on the formulary. I think to be honest, the reps obviously have been in will help you. I mean they even offer. I mean they, we wrote our own applications. Um. You know, um, asking other people, ha um, you know, asking, because there isn't that much data in dentistry. So you can present all the research when I presented it at that time was mainly non-dental non related, apart from a few studies done in Japan. Um, but actually now there should be enough people using it to at least be able to give you audit results and say, we've seen these many patients and it's great for this and it's great for that. I mean, there are cases now, I think, that if I didn't do under Remy Maslam, I think of a couple, I've done with you, Ahmed, that I think I'd put in a theatre setting older people with very low sats um, who, you know, you've got to be careful with with midazolam, um, especially if you do have good theatre access. Um, some of the Putney patients much prefer to do them with, uh, with low, if they've got low 90 sats from midazolam, if you feel much more comfortable now, I think I'd feel very uncomfortable going back. I think it's great to have as another drug for some cases. Um, thank you. Um, and another point, um, just to, to, to add is it's great for those with needle phobia in the mouth um, who just need that initial help at the beginning. Um, and then a question, have you had any disinhibition from Remy? Um, no more than I would have done with midazolam. Maybe the numbers need to go go up. Um, I think we have, like I said, with the, with the patient with learning disabilities, I've treated some who have been quite not that easy under midazolam once and thought we'd try it with Remy Mazolam. And they've been, the sedation itself has been really similar. Um, and we have had some patients who have been, you know, you know, have, we know the ones that do, that are a bit more mobile, a bit more vocal under sedation, who I suspect will have been the same with midazolam as well. Um, so I don't think, I think you get the same type of sedation. So I wouldn't use it, if, if midazolam failed, I wouldn't think, oh, I'm going to try this patient with Remy Mazolam. I was think it could be much better. Um, but we always know that some patients you know, have a good sedation day and a bad sedation day. Yeah, thank you. Um, one more question. Does Remy Mazolam need to be ordered from specific hospital pharmacy departments, much like intranasal midazolam? I don't know if you know. About um, that. I don't know in, in, in what it would be in Ireland. I think, you know, we people can um, in England, you can just order it from, um, you know, um, the distributors, the people that are making by favor. Um, but I suppose that would be 
yeah it might i don't know what it would be like in ireland i'm sorry i'm not probably... sure either to be honest if anyone um has any um ideas if they can please write it down in the comment box um it's not a controlled you... it's it's still a class three it's schedule three drug it's not a, class, a controlled drug um but a lot of hospitals will treat it as a controlled drug um mm. a lot of hospitals get worried we might mix it up with other drugs like remifentanil and things as we found out as well so um but it's good to know we always reassure people we can read which is a good thing <laughs> Yeah, the, the hospital pharmacy um, recommended we put it in a lunchbox with big writing saying Remy Mazalam to be dispensed by two consultants only um, because they, would, they were worried we'd confuse it with Remy Fentanyl. Um, and they were also worried that we couldn't read. So, yes, you know, it's, it's you know, lots of these hurdles that you have to cross um, and pick your battles. Um, do you have less operating time once you get to an endpoint or do you top up similarly to propofol? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting, actually, because at the beginning, I was like, oh, do I, especially when I was worrying, I was under sedating. I was like, oh, every two minutes, I'll give another increment. Every two minutes, I'll give another increment. Now I'm kind of like, you, 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 you give the first increment, I give the local, and then I see how they go. I normally... Um, yeah, top up regularly, but it's not, it does, I'm not watching the, in the first time we were doing it, what you had your stopwatch there to the second, and then no, no, I'm not giving another increment until it's past two minutes, but now you're getting the, and people sedate differently. So I've had some patients who it's worn off very quickly. Um, that's the only thing you have to be good at just, you know, anticipating when you need to give some, and that if you, you give a little bit, um, you have a bit of working time, then you might want to elevate and between elevate and putting four steps, you might have to give a little bit more. So, you know, for some people, they will prefer to have the operator sedation. I, I like being operator sedationist and some people like to be separate, but the working time is great because you can keep on giving it. We've had patients that have pretty much woken up. Um, to be honest, the patient can wake up, go to the toilet, come back and you can continue sedating them. Um, but with midazolam, you can't because if you suddenly give, you've got a one out, you know, we have 75 minute appointments. If at 70 minutes, I decide, you know, if at, after an hour, I decide to give some more midazolam, they'll be sitting in that chair for another 45 minutes to an hour. Whereas with remimazolam, pretty much after your last increment, they can generally leave 10 minutes, 30 minutes maximum. Nobody's, you know, we've had a couple that have taken longer to recover, but that's generally been my uh, brain injury patients. Mm. Thank you, Minnie. Um, how many cases of remi would you suggest doing with a, with a colleague before going solo? Oh, I would say at least 20. Um, I said it's a good question for you, Ahmed, because you've probably done around 20. Do you think you'd be happy doing them solo? Um, yeah, I, I, I'd be happy doing them solo. Um, I, um, I'm still working on getting the hang of the operator sedationist, um, and I will get the hang of it. Um, the thing with it that I found is that you really need to be on the ball. Like you need to have everything ready. Um, there's there's no such thing as like wasting time in terms of trying to get an instrument that's right, not right there in front of you because of that narrow sedation window. Um, and like you said, Millie, you know that you, you, you can stop it and um, they can come back um, but it might, it, it would work with some patients. It might not work with others where um, they have care resistant behavior. Um, so, so, so yeah, being on the ball and also like not relying on the coattails of the recovery phase of midazolam that you often do in terms of polishing the filling or um, doing a scaling at the end. Like once it's finished, it's finished and there's very little else that you can do after that. So, um, yeah, just working around the intricacies of that. Um, say, yeah, I think 20 is like, I, I would not, I would definitely recommend if you're starting it, do not start it just by yourself. You do. It is nice to have somebody there with you <laughs> and then having two people, you get used to working with each other and keep on doing it. And then you think, oh, actually I could, and then it gets better as you, um, the more you do and the more cotton it, and then you can go solo. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Millie. Just one more comment. Uh, very often direct costs are used as an argument to not pursue potential innovations. That's a very good point. We need to get much better at identifying non-financial benefits that would offset monetary costs to balance the case to follow new techniques. Yeah, and, and and I've had the experience of both. So I drugs therapy committee at Royal Hospital. Um, they talked about it, talked about the patient benefits. Um, they were like, that's wonderful, use it on everyone. You know, NHS trust, 30 million pounds in deficit. 
you know i would we try the but we do always do the patient benefits and everything but we, but it's a balance isn't it and i do agree and i think we have to do patient related outcome measures with those that can can do it we need to yeah get that feedback so that feedback of that patient ringing in later i didn't ask her to ring and say this was great it's really that we capture that as well as the cost um and i think again the older people looking at maybe the cost of them having a theater experience compared to Remy Maslam in a, in a dental surgery. Um, I think it's, there's, there's so much to do. Um, I think as a specialty in special care dentistry, we're so busy doing the dentistry that sometimes we don't get the chance to do the research and, and do the work around it because we are the people that are doing it day in, day out. Um, and we know the cases we do because as we've talked about in the past, you do lots of sedation for special care dentistry, but there are very few papers the papers are very old now, so that's something we all need to. I'd, I'd hope that everyone that is doing it in special care dentistry will pull all their data together and publish it, so we can get that out there to show. And then it's easy for other people to use it because we're saying here it's great for cost, it's brilliant for patients. And um, this is how you use it. This is how you set it up. This is how you go to a meeting and you can share that because at the end of the day, it will all work together to improve care for our vulnerable groups, which is hopefully why we're all in special care dentistry in the first place. You beautifully said. Thank you very much, Mindy. Um, I think we'll wrap it up here. I just want to point everyone's attention to our um summer conference, which we're excited to announce. Um, it'll be held in uh Cork this year on the um sixth and seventh of June. Um that's the sixth and seventh of June. And uh it'll be on the HSE consent policy and it will be on communication for uh, the main conference day. So this is a, a rough idea of the this is an idea of the program. And um, registration will open next week on our website and we'll send all of our members an email um to let them know to register as well. Um, so yeah, please mark that down in your calendar. Um, Millie, I'd like to thank you so much for sharing um, your fascination and your application of all of these techniques. Um, you've communicated um, your enthusiasm and um, hopefully um kind of transcended the, the the virtual space and um passed that on to the rest of us as well um thank you so much millie um and um to everyone who's joined thank you very much um this webinar will be available uh, on a recording um in the next couple of weeks on our website as well for our members um and i will let you enjoy the rest of your evenings thank you millie Yes, no problem. Thank you very much for the invite. Thank you. See you all.